so good evening all of you so welcome to the prepare to pass f7 batch so and this session is very useful for those students who are going to write the exam in june 2022 or later and i discuss i will discuss the total subject f7 or a total subject of four in 15 to 20 hours so before going to the subject coming to the exam pattern so fr is a cbe based uh, exam means computer based exam and the total hours 3 hours and the maximum number of mark, maximum marks 100 so 3 hours means how many minutes 180 minutes means per marks we have 1.8 minute per mark we have 1.8 minute so the pass mark is 50 50 marks but uh, so better to leave some time so to complete the incompleted uh, task at the end of the paper so then so consider only 1.6 minute per mark so coming to the exam pattern in a for there are three sections are there section a section b section c section a contains 15 objective questions and each question carries two marks and the total 30 marks and section b section b is guys it contains three objective case study questions and each question contains five objective questions and each question carries two marks and the total 30 marks and section C, two constructive responsive questions means two descriptive questions are there. And each question carries 20 marks in total, 40 marks. And the paper is for 100 marks and pass mark is 50, 50 marks. And if you allow the time in this way, you can complete the total paper. So for section A, better to allot 45 marks. And for section B, so 40, sorry, 45 minutes for section b 45 minutes for section c 70 minutes okay so the objective test questions are so th th these are these are the types of the objective questions so we may have mcqs or multiple response questions or fill in the blanks and drag and drop and drop down list is there so there are a number of types of objective a few questions are in this model and coming to the exam pattern and in the overall syllabus coming to the section a and section b and they may ask from any area in the whole syllabus coming to the section c so questions may come from the only four areas interpretation of the financial statements ratio analysis financial statement of the group entities and financial statement of single entity and cash flow statement so these carry 40 marks and these carry 60 marks and coming to our session in day one we complete these topics IAS 16 40 20 23 41 38 36 82 so majorly in this session i am going to concentrate on the assets so tangible as well as intangible assets and related topics in day two these topics day three day four and day five interpretation of the financial statements so coming to the without wasting the time and entering into the subject coming to the first standard ifr is 13 so nothing but what fair value measurement here what is meant by fair value generally so first before going to that the standard is not a standalone standard and the standard is not applied individually it is always applied along with another standard always applied along with uh, another standard like for example ia 16 is the property plant and equipment so there there is a one concept called revaluation of asset so in that case we need to compare the carrying amount with the fair value there we use this standard what is meant by fair value in case of ias 40 also and in case of IAS 41, in case of IAS 2, so this standard is not applied individually, it always applied along with another standard. So first what is meant by fair value? Generally fair value is nothing but what exit price. 
fair value is nothing but what exit price if you sell the product in the market how much amount you are going to receive that is said to be about fair value that is relating to what i said for example i have a marker if i sell the marker in the market then how much amount i realize it that is said to be a fair value but coming to the liability so live in case of liability also exit price of the liability is said to be a fair value here exit price uh, is uh, not equal to the settlement price so exit price means if you make the another party for making the payment if you arrange the another party if you transfer the total liability to the third party for making the payment at what cost you transfer that is said to be a fair value the price at which the liability is transferred to the third party is called as what fair value for the liability fair value for the liability then so fair value generally required to be measured on recurring basis or on non recurring basis means we may use the fair value regularly like in case of ias 40 or in case of um, ias uh, uh, ias uh, 16 and we may use the fair value regularly but coming to the Uh, non recurring basis means that fair value is not used regularly so fair value may be required to be measured on recurring basis or on non recurring basis or on non recurring basis then how to measure the fair value how to measure the fair value so there are three approaches are there for measuring the fair value one is market approach another one is cost approach another one is income approach coming to the market approach in case of market approach what is the fair value if you sell the product in the market how much amount we realized that is said to be a fair value so if you sell the product in the market how much amount is realized that is said to be our fair value but coming to the cost approach so in case of cost approach so you for example you purchase the product 5 years or 10 years back and utilize the product uh, in the business for production of the goods or for uh, or for administrative purpose whatever may be if you want to purchase the respected plant and machinery or respected property at the present how much amount you need to pay that is called as what current cost and we also call it as what current replacement cost for the as per the cost approach that current replacement cost is said to be our fair value So, so in case of cost approach what is the fair value current replacement cost nothing but if you want to purchase the existing product at the present from the market how much amount required to pay is said to be about fair value coming to the income approach coming to the income approach so what is meant by fair value what is meant by fair value in case of income approach the fair value is nothing but the present value of so present value of benefits derived from the respected asset in the future benefits derived from the respected asset in the future is said to be a what fair value so for example for example asset property plant and equipment is there that useful life of the respected equipment is around 4 uh, years and it will generate the benefits of around 1 lakh and 2 lakh so 3 lakh and 4 lakh these are all what future benefits these are all what future benefits then what is the present value of that future benefits for bringing that future benefits to the present value we need to discount that cash flows the present value of the future cash flows is a technically called as what fair value is a technically called as what fair value so how much benefits we are going to receive in the future then what is the present value of that benefit means you need to bring that uh, benefit from the future to the present and for bringing that we apply what a discounting factor that summation of the discounting of the cash flows to be generated in future from the respected asset is said to be about fair value of the respected asset fair value of the respected asset we call it as present value of the cash flows present value of the cash flow so there are three approaches for measuring the fair value one is market approach another one is cost approach another one is income approach in case of market approach 
if you sell the product in the market how much amount we are going to receive is said to be a fair value coming to the cost approach if you want to purchase the existing product from the market how much amount required to pay is said to be about current replacement cost and we consider it as a fair value and in case of income approach so in case of income approach the present price of the product is not considered and we arrive the fair value from the future benefits what is the summation of discounted values of the future cash flows or what is the present value of the cash flows generated from the respected asset in the future is said to be about fair value as per what income approach so for measuring the respected fair value we consider number of inputs and that inputs we took in hierarchy basis there is a that is nothing but level 1 input and a level 2 input and a level 3 input so coming to the level 1 input so if there is an identical product if there is an identical product in the active market then what is the quoted price what is the quoted price of that identical product what is meant by identical product for example i have a mobile phone i have a mobile phone so then so the if the same mobile available in the market at what price if the same mobile having the same feature and the same version and the same branding company same branding so if the same mobile is available in the market at what price that is said to be about quoted price of the identical product in that case adjustment for the respected price is not required that's why we use the word unadjusted quoted price unadjusted quoted price so but coming to the level 2 in case of level 2 it is applied for similar assets not for identical asset if the identical asset is not available in the market if the level 1 inputs are not useful or not available in the market then we go to the level 2 if the identical product is not available in the product in the market then we go to the level 2 in case of level 2 we verify about is there any similar product available in the market or not so similar product means having the same feature having the same feature but the branding is different for example i have the oppo a9 2020 if the same features are there in the samsung but the brand value of the samsung is different from the oppo so these are said to be a similar product but not the identical product so when we consider the quoted price of the samsung quoted price of the samsung we have to consider what is the brand value of the oppo to know the quoted price that's why here we use the word quoted price adjusted some adjustment is required what is the quoted price of the similar product plus or minus uh, adjustments plus or minus adjustment then coming to the level 3 in case of level 1 and level 2 these prices are present available in the market that's why we use the word observable observable prices but to level 3 if the product is not available either identical product or similar product if the product is not available in the market then level 3 will apply that's why we use the word in case of unobservable inputs for the assets or liability based upon in that case how to calculate the fair value based on best available information and that value should be arrived based on the available information based on the available information this is about what level 1 level 2 and uh, level 3 so generally level 1 level 1 is considered as a what so it is covered in the market approach it is covered in the market approach so this is about what fair value fair value measurement next coming to the ias 16 so in case of ias 16 property plant and equipment this is what non current asset first of all what is meant by non current asset non current asset is nothing but it is a economic resource controlled by the entity which provides some economic benefits to the entity for a period more than one accounting period is said to be a non-current asset so property plant and equipment is a non-current tangible asset 
non current tangible asset so in this standard we have to discuss what is the how to recognize the ppe what is the initial recognition how to recognize initially and what is what about the subsequent recognition so and what how to calculate the depreciation and how to account for depreciation what about the revaluation of assets so these we are going to discuss so coming to the recognition so generally the property plant and equipment is recorded or is recognized in the books of account only if it satisfies the definition of a PPE and only if it satisfies the definition criteria of the non-current asset and the cost of the respected asset is measured reliably. He clearly stated it is probable that future economic benefits associated with the asset will flow to the entity future economic benefits associated with the asset will flow to the entity and the cost of the asset should be measured reliably cost of the asset should be measured reliably if these two conditions are satisfied then we recognize the respected item as a property plant and equipment and uh, not only the initial cost even for example if the subsequently after purchase of the property plant and equipment uh, if any subsequent expenditure incurred shall we consider that subsequent expenditure as a ppe or treated as a revenue expenditure depends upon whether it satisfy the recognition criteria or not if the subsequent expenditure satisfy these recognition criteria then we treat that expenditure as a capital expenditure and we capitalize means that that amount is added to the respected asset value if that subsequent expenditure is not satisfying the recognition criteria we have to treat that amount as a revenue expenditure and that amount is written off by transfer to statement of profit and loss then coming to the initial recognition initially pp is recorded at what price cost but in subsequent period we may follow either cost model or a revaluation model first what is meant by cost sir cost is nothing but it includes cost incurred in bringing the asset into the working condition initial cost and present value of dismantling cost so the cost of a property plant and equipment it covers purchase price purchase price plus initial cost of nothing but cost uh, for developing the site and borrowing cost and any grants received etc those are all covered and uh, plus cost incurred for bringing the asset into working condition nothing but what installation cost transportation freight etc and the present value of a dismantling cost of the asset at the end of the useful life means if the asset life of the asset is around 10 years then after completion of the 10 years you need to dismantle the asset you need to remove the asset and replace with a new one then for dismantling that asset how much amount you are going to spend that is what future cost required to be spent then what is the present value of that future cost is also included in the cost of the property plant and uh, equipment is also included in property plant and equipment if you consider here purchase price and initial cost and cost incur for bringing the asset into working condition this is what present cost and we spent in terms of cash but the present value of dismantling cost of the asset at the end of the useful life is said to be about future cost said to be about future cost for example purchase price is around 10 lakh dollar and present value of dismantling the respected asset is around 2 lakh then the total amount of the cost is 12 lakh then what is the journal entry to be recorded here so debit property plant and equipment account credit cash account so pl property plant and equipment is how much 12 lakh but the 12 lakh is not spent 12 lakh was not spent at present we spent only 10 lakh 
and the remaining 2 lakh to be spent in the future for that we have to use the provision for dismantling the asset is a how much 2 lakh provision for dismantling the asset is how much 2 lakh then so every year at the end of the every year so throughout the life of the asset at the end of the every year we need to add the interest so this is on the date of uh, acquisition then at the end of the year so at the end of the year we need to write so we need to add the interest for this amount then we write debit interest account uh, credit provision for dismantling account for example 10 percent is there so 20 thousand and 20 thousand this interest is transferred to profit and loss statement again second year we write the same entry so debit interest credit provision for dismantling cost 2 lakh 20 into 10 percent 22 thousand is there in this way every year we need to add the finance cost to the provision for dismantling account and this amount consolidated and pulled together and that fund is used to pay the dismantling cost at the end of the useful life and that at that at the end of the useful life or at the end of the 10th year we need to pay the dismantling cost then we have to write debit provision for dismantling account a credit cash or bank account the amount required to pay this is about what cost of the asset okay. then so subsequent expenditure already we discussed if it satisfies the recognition criteria treated it as a so asset as per IA 16 otherwise treated as revenue expenditure transfer to statement of profit and loss then coming to the subsequent recognition so in case of subsequent recognition two models are there we may follow either cost model or revaluation model cost model or revaluation model in case of the cost model the asset is recorded at what cost minus accumulated uh, depreciation if any and minus if any indication for impairment then that impairment loss is reduced this is what the book value or carrying amount of that asset at the end of the useful life here the depreciation is a nothing but the systematic allocation of the depreciable amount over the useful life of the asset is called as what depreciation simply the reduction in the value of an asset and for calculating depreciation we follow either straight line method or wdv method or machine hours rate method we may follow any one of these methods so this is about what cost model but coming to the revaluation model at the end of the every year the book value of the asset uh, is compared with the fair value is compared with the fair value when we compared then there is there is a there may be two chances one is increase for example cost cost of the asset is a uh, 10 lakh and accumulated depreciation is a uh, 3 lakh then total book value is a uh, 7 lakh then the fair value of the asset is around 9 lakh fair value of the asset is around uh, 9 lakh then then so there is an increase uh, in the value of the asset and this is called as what upward this is called as what upward revaluation here how much increase is there 9 lakh minus 7 lakh is equal to 2 lakh and this 2 lakh is a transfer to revaluation surplus account this transfer to which account revaluation surplus account and which is required to be shown as a part of reserves and surplus and in the year of creation it is shown as a part of other comprehensive income it is shown as a part of what other comprehensive income 
other comprehensive income then what is the journal entry to be recorded for this purpose we have to write so debit so there is an increase in value of an asset but remember that increase in value first adjusted to the accumulated depreciation and if any excess amount is there that is adjusted to the cost then we have to write debit provision for depreciation account nothing but accumulated depreciation account credit revaluation surplus account of how much amount is there so 9 lakh minus 7 lakh 2 lakh so 2 lakh is sufficient to set off the accumulated depreciation so just 2 lakh is there for example the fair value of the asset is around 11 lakh so then the 11 lakh minus 7 lakh how much amount is this 4 lakh that 4 lakh is used to set off the accumulated depreciation and excess amount is there how much 1 lakh is there that 1 lakh adjusted to cost then we have to write the entry debit accumulated depreciation account to 3 lakh debit cost of the asset nothing but PPE account to 1 lakh credit revaluation surplus account to 4 lakh revaluation surplus account to 4 lakh this revaluation surplus is shown as a part of reduction and surplus and in the year of uh, creation we have to show in the income statement as a part of what other comprehensive income this is what first time revaluation this is what first time revaluation then for example in the subsequent revaluation Subsequent revaluation means revaluation happened in the subsequent period. After first time revaluation, any, any revaluation happened is covered under what subsequent revaluation. So, in case of subsequent revaluation, there is a two chances either increase or decrease. So, in case of increase in value, that is transferred to revaluation surplus directly. That is credited to revaluation surplus. How much amount increase is there? That is credited to revaluation surplus account. But in case of a decrease, in case of a decrease, so generally, in case of decrease in value of an asset, that is transferred to statement of profit and loss. But here, decrease in value of an asset, decrease in value of an asset, first adjusted to revaluation surplus account and the remaining after writing of the revaluation surplus if any amount is there that is adjusted to statement of profit and loss that is adjusted to statement of profit and loss and the same case happened in case of uh, so downward revaluation also so this is about what cost model this is about what revaluation model so in case of revaluation first time increase in value of an asset is transferred to what revaluation surplus transferred to what revaluation surplus and decrease in value of an asset transferred to statement of profit and loss under two this is the first time revaluation then coming to the subsequent revaluation Coming to the subsequent revaluation, first time increase and uh, subsequent also increase. First time increase, subsequent also increase. Then difference is transferred to what revaluation surplus only. Both are same. First time increase, subsequent also increase. Just transfer credit given to the revaluation surplus. But first time increase, subsequent is the decrease. First time increase, subsequent decrease. Then decrease in value in the subsequent period. First adjusted to revaluation surplus and the remaining amount transferred to statement of profit and loss. So first adjusted to revaluation surplus. If any excess is transferred to statement of profit and loss. Okay. Then in the same way coming to the downward. First time decrease. So first time decrease. So first time decrease and subsequent also decrease. First time decrease, subsequent also decrease. Then the difference amount transferred to statement of profit and loss directly. But first time decrease, second time increase. 
second time increase then that increase in value first adjusted to statement of profit and loss and excess amount is transferred to what revaluation surplus first increase in value first adjusted to statement of profit and loss and excess amount adjusted to what revaluation surplus revaluation surplus this is about what revaluation of uh, assets and uh, so remember in case of revaluation the tree asset uh, is shown at revalued figure asset is shown at revalued figure and this amount this revalued figure is going to be depreciated in the future is going to be depreciated in the future that's why in this case we have to show revalued amount minus accumulated depreciation in the future accumulated depreciation in the future so and another one is already discussed revaluation surplus is shown as other comprehensive income in the year of what creation in the year of creation not in subsequent period only in the year of creation we show it as a part of what other comprehensive income other comprehensive income next so review of the useful life under review of this scrap value and changes in the method of depreciation we assumed it as change in accounting estimation change in accounting estimation so i will explain one item for example if the value of the cost of the asset is around 10 lakh and useful life is around 10 years and we provide the depreciation for five years then accumulated depreciation is around so 10 lakh by 10 years into five nothing but how much five lakh then book value at the end of the fifth year is equal to 10 lakh minus five lakh how much five lakh at the end of the fifth year the useful life is reviewed as another 10 years actually out of the 10 years 5 years already completed then 5 years remaining are the remain 5 years are there but if you review the useful life at the end of the fifth year there is a 10 years more in that case the book value available on the date of review on the date of review what is the book value 5 lakh this 5 lakh is allotted this 5 lakh is a uh, allocated over the remaining useful life what is the remaining useful life further 10 years so 5 lakh by 10 is equal to 50,000 per annum is the depreciation from the next year onward from the sixth year onwards so in this way in case of change in accounting estimation we have to give the impact of that change in accounting estimation from the date of change and in the future not from the past adjustment not required in the past adjustment of changes in accounting estimation is required only at the present and in future not in past we call it as what prospective effect we call it as what prospective effect and the prospective effect is required in these all cases and so one more topic in case of ia 16 is nothing but what sale of asset sale of asset so remember in case of sale of asset first calculate book value on the date of uh, sale on the date we need to provide the depreciation till the date of sale then second compare uh, this book value with the sale price compare this book value with the sale price and the difference is uh, treated as either profit or loss on sale of PPE profit or loss on sale of PPE which is transferred to statement of profit and loss so in case of sale of asset so remember these three steps first calculate what is the book value of that PPE on the date of sale then second compare that book value with the selling price then the difference is treated as either profit or loss on sale of that asset which is transferred to profit and loss statement this is about what ppe property plant and equipment next next coming to ias uh, sorry
So IAS 40, nothing but what investment property. Generally, investment property is a nothing but any asset held by the party or any asset acquired by the party to earn the income in the form of rent. To earn the income in the form of rent or for capital appreciation or for both. For example, I purchase the building and give it on rental basis. Then that building is said to be about investment property. Or I purchase the land just to retain it for 10 years because I think the value of the respected land will be increased in the future. Means that asset is maintained for capital appreciation purpose that is said to be investment property. So investment property covers either land or building which is held by the party for earning the rental income or for capital appreciation of both is said to be about investment property. If the property is purchased and utilized for self purpose or utilized for his own family purpose, that is not an investment property. If the property purchased by the party utilized for the business purpose, that is not said to be investment property. So those are covered under property plant and equipment and are accounted as per IAS 16. But in case of investment property, you have to help either land or a building and those must be provided on rental basis to the another party and or you may retain it, retain, you may retain as idle for the capital appreciation purpose. Then only those are said to be about investment property. So owners occupied is covered under IA 60, not under IA 40 and business purpose is not covered here. It is also covered under IA 16 and for example, part of the property is uh, for business purpose, part of the property is provided on rental basis. Then only that part of the property which is provided on rental basis is covered under IA 40, nothing but investment property. The remaining part of the building which was used for business purpose is covered under IA 16, nothing but property plant and uh, equipment. Then coming to that, initially the property plant and equipment is recognized at what cost? That cost is calculated as we already discussed in IA 16. But subsequently, you may follow either cost model or fair value model. If you follow the cost model, then account it as per IAS 16. Nothing but at the end of the year, every year, we need to provide the depreciation and that investment property shown at cost less accumulated depreciation. But coming to the fair value model, coming to the fair value model, at the end of the year, every year, the investment property value is reviewed investment property value is reviewed we need to calculate fair value of the respected property at the end of the every year is there any increase or decrease in the fair value is a transfer to statement of profit and loss remember there is a difference in revaluation as per IAS 16 and as per IAS 40 in case of IAS 16 increase in value of the asset is transferred to revaluation surplus decrease in value transfer to statement of profit and loss but coming to IAS 40, either increase or decrease in value of the investment property is a transfer to statement of profit and loss. So cost model, this is accounted as per IAS 16. Fair value model, this is revalued to the fair value at the end of each year and gain or loss, either increase or decrease will be transferred to statement of profit and loss and not shown as a part of other comprehensive income. That is, so this gain or loss is shown as a part of other income not as a part of other comprehensive income and no depreciation charged on this asset if you follow the fair value model but depreciation is required to be calculated if you follow which model cost model next if the asset is transferred from PPE to the investment property so means if the asset is shifted from IAS 16 to IAS 40. IAS 16 to IAS 40. In that case, so whether you follow the which method? So in case of IAS 16, you follow the cost model or fair value model. Right, sorry, IAS 40. If the cost model is followed, the asset is transferred into investment property at the current carrying amount. Current carrying amount means on the date of transfer calculate what is the book value of that asset at that 
book value we transfer it to the investment property because in case of investment property means as per IAS 40 or as per IAS 16 cost model is same but the difference is nothing but fair value model in case of fair value model if that asset is shifted from the IAS 16 to IAS 40 then first revalue the asset on the date of transfer as per IAS 16 first revalue the asset as per IAS 16 then increase in value transfer to revaluation surplus decrease in value transfer to statement of profit and loss then from that day onwards account it as per IAS 40 so nothing but first on 1-4-2022 that asset is revalued that sorry that asset shifted from IAS 16 to IAS 40 then first revalue the asset as per IAS 16 on 1-4-2022 remember for example if there is an increase in value of an asset transfer to revaluation surplus or a decrease in value of an asset transfer to statement of profit and loss then the fair value on the date of revaluation is transferred to IAS 40 and from that day onwards after 1-4-2022 that property is valued as per IAS 40 next if the asset is transferred from IA investment property to property plant and equipment and the party follow the cost model party follow the cost model then on the date of transfer first calculate what is the current carrying amount already we discussed in case of cost model IA 16 and IAS 40 both are same then what is the book value at that price we transfer just heading is changed but coming to the fair value model First calculate what is the fair value as per IAS 40 here as per IAS 40 first then increase or decrease transfer to statement of profit and loss then from that day onwards we account it as per IAS 60 okay so same case is there first we apply the original old standard later we apply the new standard that's all so this is about what transferring of the property from one standard to another standard from IAS 16 to IAS 40 or from IAS 40 to IAS 16 then coming to the IAS 20 government grants then so what is meant by government grant government grant is nothing but it is a one type of assistance provided by the government to the entity for meeting the revenue expenditure or for meeting the capital expenditure said to be a government grant means that grant that assistance that financial assistance or non-financial assistance provided by the government for purchase of fixed asset or for payment of the regular operating expenses that type of assistance is said to be about government grant then so assistance by the government in the form of transfer of resources to the entity in return for past or future compliance with certain condition these are so some grants are subjected to fulfillment of the conditions some some grants are not required to fulfill the conditions relating to the operating activities of the entity they exclude those forms of government assistance which cannot be reasonably have a value placed upon them and transaction with the government which cannot be distinguished from the normal trading transaction of the entity then these government grants are generally classified into the two type one is a revenue grant another one is capital grant revenue grant means grant is received relating to the income or for meeting the day-to-day -day operations day-to-day -day operating expenses that is said to be revenue grant so if this revenue grant is shown this revenue grant is shown either on the credit side as a income or reduced from the expense on the debit side we may show it on the credit side as an income or reduced from the corresponding expense reduced from the corresponding expense okay so clearly stated it is shown as a part of other income or alternative direct from the related expenses and uh, one more thing is previously we discussed so that grant is subjected to fulfillment of the condition if the party does not satisfy the respected condition then whatever the grant you received will be refunded to the government that will be refunded to the government so how to at the time of refundment refunding the government grant then what are the accounting treatment 
so at the time of refunding so that is so if you consider the revenue grant as another income previously then we have to consider it as a part of the expense in the current year if you consider it as a deduction from the expense then add back that amount to the corresponding expense add back that amount to the corresponding expense then coming to the capital grant it is always relating to the purchase of the fixed asset then in case of the capital grant also there are three sorry two methods are there one is considered as a deferred income or deduct the grant from the carrying amount nothing but in this case book value of the asset on the date of a grant is considered from that we have to reduce what capital grant we may reduce from the carrying amount of the asset uh, so or we may show it as a deferred income in case of deferred income and then like so we need to transfer then what is the journal entry to be recorded so debit bank account credit deferred income account credit deferred income account and this deferred income of around how much amount we are going to receive for example 2 lakh the 2 lakh will be apportioned uh, over the useful life of the asset in the in the proportionate of depreciation in the proportionate of depreciation so deferred income is apportioned over the useful life of the asset and is transferred to statement of profit and loss so in which ratio in the proportionate of a depreciation so here in the second method so the grant reduced from the carrying amount of the asset then net carrying amount is apportioned over the remaining useful life of the asset. Next. So repayment of the grant. Repayment of the grant is nothing but if the conditions are not fulfilled by the entity, then whatever the grant you received previously are required to be repaid to the government. And that is called as what? Refundment, refund of the government grant. So repayment of the grant relating to the income or applied for stagnant any unamortized deferred credit and then in the profit and uh, loss if it is relating to the deferred income then first write it off the deferred credit and then transfer to the profit and loss for example repayment grant relating to the asset or recorded by increasing the carrying amount of asset or reducing the deferred income balance any resultant cumulative to extra depreciation is recognized in profit and uh, loss is recognized in profit and loss a government grant that become repayable is accounted for change in accounting estimation and is according and is accounted in accordance with ias 8 nothing but accounting policies change in accounting estimations and errors this is about what government grant then so coming to the next one borrowing cost is 23 so borrowing cost generally includes what it includes interest expenses calculated by applying effective rate of interest effective rate of interest or any finance charge in respect of the finance leases recognized in accordance with IA 17 pages and exchange difference arising from the foreign currency borrowings to the extent they are recorded as a adjustment to the interest so borrowing cost simply said interest expense incurred by using the interest expense calculated by using the effective rate of interest as per IAS 39 or it may include finance charges finance charges or any cost incurred at the time of obtaining the borrowing etc these are all included then borrowing cost must be capitalized as a part of cost of the asset if the asset is a qualifying asset so what is meant by qualifying asset so qualifying asset is nothing but the asset which take some period for ready to use with the asset which takes some period for ready to use so that is said to be a qualifying asset for example building is not said to be a qualifying asset because already completed that is ready to accommodate ready to 
accommodate that is not a qualifying asset but construction of the building is said to be a qualifying asset because construction require some period to complete the building that's why that is covered under what qualifying asset so borrowing cost is required to be capitalized if it is relating to what qualifying asset then commencement of the borrowing so IAS 23 states that capitalization of the borrowing cost should be commenced when all the following conditions are met. Capitalization of the borrowing cost should met should be commenced when all the five conditions are met. All the following conditions are met. First expenditure for the asset is being incurred. First we have to spend the expenditure. Second one borrowing costs are being incurred. And the third one activities that are necessary to prepare the asset for its intended use or sale or in progress activities that are necessary to prepare the asset for its intended use or for sale or in progress then if these three conditions are satisfied expenditure for asset is being incurred borrowing cost are being incurred for example no borrowing cost spent during the year then that borrowing cost is not required to be capitalized borrowing cost can be maximum amount of the borrowing cost can be capitalized is nothing but to the extent of amount already spent in relation to the borrowing cost nothing was spent no requirement to capitalize the borrowing cost and the return on rate of interest may be specific rate or general borrowing in case of weighted average rate of interest in case of general borrowing for example specific borrowing is a nothing but the amount of the borrowing taken to purchase the specific property or asset to purchase the specific property or asset that is said to be specific borrowing in that case what is the rate of interest for example 10 percent per annum this is applied this is treated as a uh, rate of interest required to calculate borrowing cost but in case of uh, general borrowing so for example 10 lakh and the rate of uh, interest is 10 percent rate of interest is 20 percent per annum. these are the general borrowing means those borrowings other than specific borrowing in that case how to calculate amount of interest 10 lakh into two, just assume all the loans are taken at the beginning of the year 10 lakh into 10 percent 1 lakh 5 lakh into 20 percent 1 lakh total 2 lakhs then what is the total amount of the borrowing 15 lakhs so 2 lakh by 15 lakh into 100 so 2 lakh by 15 lakhs into 100 equal to 13.33 this is the weighted average rate of interest this is what weighted and it means what is the total amount of interest by total amount of borrowing total amount of interest by total amount of borrowing that is what weighted average rate of interest and where the funds are borrowed specifically to acquire the qualifying asset the borrowing cost which may be capitalized are those actually incurred less investment income on the temporary investment of the borrowing during the capitalized period for example we took the loan around 10 lakh for purchase of plant and machinery and we spent around 6 lakhs during the year and the out of the remaining 4 lakh 2 lakh spent 2 lakh utilized by the party so 2 lakh uh, invested uh, somewhere then while calculating the borrowing cost we have to reduce income to be received income to be received that is clearly stated actual amount incurred less any investment income any investment income 
on temporary investment of the borrowing during the period should be capitalized so how much amount required to be capitalized the amount of the borrowing cost minus investment income minus investment income then cessation of the capitalization of the asset so substantially all activities necessary to prepare the qualifying asset for its intended use or sale or completed so when the borrowing cost capitalization is uh, stopped when the asset uh, count construction of the asset or when the asset came to available for utilization when the asset came to available for utilization so whichever is uh, earlier which are, sorry, whichever is earlier from that day onwards capitalization borrowing cost is not required to be capitalized not required to be capitalized so it clearly says stated substantially all the activities necessary to prepare the qualifying activity qualifying asset for its intended use or sale or completed that related activities are already completed but here construction is suspended or due to the industrial disputes okay so this is about what borrowing cost yes of borrowing cost simply remember so specific borrowing direct rate is considered in case of general borrowing we have to consider weighted average cost of rate of interest weighted average cost of rate of interest in this way we need to calculate this is about what ias 23 IAS 23. Then coming to the next one, IAS 38. 